All right. Thank you for that very nice introduction and for almost destroying your computer. Um, it is really great to be here uh, in Louisville and to be at this event, and I want to thank you guys for having me. Um, it is, I will say that I'm a very proud native of Delaware, but I would definitely not put any of our subs or our water ice against your bourbon in any way, shape, or form. So there is that. Um, and it is, you know, it's pretty great to be, given my own personal inclinations to be and a, basically the capital of basketball and bourbon. So it's a pretty great city to visit. And as a um, Georgetown, very avid Georgetown basketball fan, I feel like I can now visit here now that Louisville has moved on from the Big East to bigger and better things and you're no longer embarrassing my team on a fairly regular basis. So, so I had to take up kind of a respite from visiting Louisville, but I can come back now. This is not my first visit to Kentucky. I have been visited here with President Obama um, a couple times over the years, both in the campaign and then here in the White House. And he, loved, he has a lot of fondness in his heart for Kentucky, in part because he's a huge basketball fan, and any basketball fan would have fondness for Kentucky. But also um, because of the way Kentucky led the nation on the Affordable Care Act. I know the Affordable Care Act is a divisive issue in a very divisive time in this country, but as a pure matter of governmental and technical and digital competence, Kentucky led the nation. And as it was very clear, your website worked better than ours. Um, uh, but he, you know, when, when he talks about people who led the way and, and helped people in a way in which Affordable Care Act was meant to do, uh, the, the Kentucky is at the top of his mind. As was mentioned in the introduction, I went to work for President Obama eight years ago, um, at the very first days of the campaign, back when we were working in a very small windowless office with like 10 people in Washington, D.C., with ironically, very spotty internet, and um, in that, and we got to go to, and went through that period, through the campaign, through the second campaign, through six years in the White House, and in my mind, that eight years that I worked for President Obama, it represents the period of the greatest change in how humans consume and distribute information since the invention of the printing press or the telegraph. The world changed in that time. And my position, working for the president at the time, gave me a chance to sort of be on the front lines as his campaigns and his White House navigated this new environment, this sort of the midst of this digital revolution. To give you some sense of how much the world has changed, because it's happening so fast, think about this. When President Obama started running for president, um, Twitter, Instagram had not been invented. The Facebook was primarily used by college kids around the country. Twitter was something that was barely, that was used only in Silicon Valley with sort of tech folks, tech folks communicating with each other and had, they had not really figured out how to use it yet. And perhaps most importantly, the smartphone as, we come to, as, we've, as we've come to know it had not been invented. And so the idea at the beginning of this campaign that you would be in a world where you could stream um, video and television, uh, or watch movies on your phone was impossible to imagine. And if you think about that, in the eight years since the smartphone, the, the modern smartphone was essentially invented, the, we are now in a place where um, by the end of next year, a third of the world will be walking around with smartphones. So a third of the world with power, with a, walking around with a powerful computer in their hand. In just eight years, that's amazing. We started out in the campaign, Facebook existed, and there had been sort of smaller social networks before that, but the idea of social networks was something that was very sort of obscure and it was not a commonly used phrase. There are currently um, two billion people on social networks around the world. Facebook, something that was so small when we started in the campaign that most people had no idea what it was. We had to teach the campaign how to sign up for it. Um, now has a social network that is over a billion people. So Facebook social network is now the largest country in the world on some days which is an amazing thing. And I say all that just to try to give some perspective to the amount of change, because it's happening so fast, I think we, we don't always know, we, it's hard, we don't always have a sense of it. It's sort of like sitting in an airplane, you don't really know how fast you're going, but you get across the country in four hours. And you know, I think that that's the world in which we're living um, te technologically. And this change has fundamentally rewritten all the rules for communications, public relations, marketing, campaign, PR, so the whole world of digital communications. And to think about this, when I started in uh, my first political communications job right out of college, 
we thought we were very innovative. This is in the late 90s, um, so 100 years ago to a lot of people in this room. And we thought we were very innovative because we were blast faxing our press releases to everyone. <laughs> but by the time I left the White House, I could not, for all the money in the world, have told you where the fax machine was. Like, did not know where it was, never used it, didn't think about it. And this is sort of, to understand how, um, and this change is, is something that I think a lot of people haven't fully comprehended in the marketing and, and communications and government world. And I think people in this room, you are clearly on the cutting edge of that, otherwise you would not be at the Digital Association meeting. Um, but is to under, I think to understand how the world has changed is to think about how the world was and what it is now. The old world before the internet was what is often referred to as a broadcast world. And the way to think about that is that information was distributed to the public from a small set of media outlets. It was a very simple world. Newspapers, the New York Times, CBS, I have to mention CNN apparently, um, told you um, what, the, what there was, and then you just received that information, you took it on board, and there was really nothing you could do with it. You could talk about the kitchen table or the water cooler, but, but your capacity to influence a larger public debate was incredibly limited. For the communications professional, this was a great deal. You do, your, you do your press conference, you put out your press release, it gets on television, it gets in the newspaper, you're done, pat yourself on the back, go home, have a bourbon or a beer or whatever, and you feel good about yourself. For the consumer, it was simple, but you had very little choice. If the press wanted to talk about the weather nonstop, you were going to hear about the weather, even if you were interested in other things. The internet destroyed that world. It blew it up, disrupted it, to use an overused term. And um, we now live in what folks refer to as a networked world, in a world in which information is no longer passed directly to the consumer from you know, some set of media executives in New York and Washington, D.C., Media information is now passed along through millions of social networks from, pe from people's Facebook feeds or Twitter feeds to your friends, people on your email chains, your text chains, whatever it is. And then, and then you receive it from a social media feed, you pass it on to yours. And information is moving around from all sorts of different sources, maybe people you trust, maybe people you don't trust. And it's moving so quickly. And the, ver the veracity and ability, credibility of the information is in question, but it is moving incredibly quickly. And this for the consumer is in, in many ways, while it's chaotic and confusing, it's great news because now you have all kinds of choices. And, and, but for the communications and PR professional, and particularly someone working in the White House, it's incredibly challenging to do your job because the, the media has become democratized and, de, and disaggregated. And you're gonna have to work hard to get your message out. You can no longer just, if you work in the White House, perfect example is, um, hold a nationally televised address, ask time for the networks to go on, as President Reagan did a lot, and reach the entire country. Uh, I'll give you an example. For when, when Reagan would give his nationally televised address, he would reach you know, 70, 80 million people. When Barack Obama does it, he reaches 20 million people if we're lucky. It's just because people have so many more choices now and they're watching less television. But Here's the, here's the good news if, you're in, if you were in the communications and p public relations and marketing space, which is if you, for the people who understand how the new world works and understand the new tools available to them, you, have a, you, can, you have now have a comparative advantage over 90% of the rest of the world who are still operating from a broadcast world mentality. You have new tools. You have a capacity to target your message like never before. You can create your own content. You don't, if, you want, if you want to have people see video of, your event, you don't have to hope the TV news covers it, you can put it on YouTube, you can put it on your website, you can share it, you can do a Vine. And I think most importantly, you're not dependent on the news anymore to get your message out. Like in the White House, I'll give you an example, in the fall of 2014, the entire media world decided that we were gonna have a panic attack about the possibility Ebola would come to the US shores. And nothing we did would get the media to talk about anything other than Ebola, it was apparently good for ratings. Um, and you know, and every night the network news would spend 18 of their 22 minutes on Ebola. I think the other four minutes was probably on weather somewhere, and that was it. But we had messages to get on other things, the economy, immigration, other policies we'd have. The public was interested in other things, and so we, so we had other tools. We could, go, we could do a Facebook chat, we could put out our own content, we could put stuff on Instagram. We had an ability to get our message out. So there are huge advantages now for the communications professional in this world. And 
as I said, my experience working for President Obama gave me an opportunity to be sort of on the cutting edge of that, to see it, because ultimately my job was to figure out how to get our message out in this incredibly chaotic, changing world where the rule book was changing every day. All the things I learned when I started in communi political communications were irrelevant by the time we got to the Obama campaign. It was changing before us. And so this is the world that Obama, Barack Obama decided to run for president in. And early in that campaign, we got a glimpse of how the world was changing. And so we'd only been in the race for about a month. So this is early 2007, I guess. And the president did, as politicians do, we went to California to raise money. And while we were there, we decided the president was able to get a meeting with Steve Jobs. And I think we wanted him to give us money. I'm pretty sure he didn't, but it's also Steve Jobs. So if you get to meet with Steve Jobs, you do that, right? And the president wanted to just wanted to meet him because he also likes Apple products, and, uh, but also pick his brain on how the world was changing. And Jobs had a lot of thoughts. Uh, but in addition to his thoughts, which were all obviously very smart, um, he brought with him a prototype of the new iPhone. And at the time, it's, you know, it's hard now, every, when you think of phones, you think of Apple. But back in 2007, Apple was known for computers and iPods. The idea that they were gonna make phones, like something like Nokia and Motorola made, was like, kind of blew people's brains. And we had been using Blackberries for you know, about, at that point, five or six years, and like, we were you know, addicted to it, and we would send all our emails from it. And the idea that anything could replace the Blackberry seemed crazy, and so Steve Jobs brings out this phone, and not that I have to hold it up, you all know what an iPhone looks like, but if you put yourself in the mentality of 2007, it's a flat piece of glass with one button, basically, and a touch screen. And like, we thought this was the craziest thing in the world, like who would ever possibly use this? But then Jobs shows it to the president, he shows the new uh, web browser so you can actually like, read articles, which you could not really do in a Blackberry in any real way. He showed him video, um, which was slow, but it was video, and that was just also like mind-boggling. And the, but the, you know, the, we walked out there, we were like, that's very cool, and we should put our name on the list for that right now. And the president, but the president did say to us, this is gonna change the world. The world is gonna change when this is co comes out. And that, he was right about that, obviously, but it also was sort of a metaphor for our campaign, because as we were thinking about, the, as we were starting the campaign, it, we knew the internet in a digital approach was the key to success, and here's why. Um, and it's important to remember that when Barack Obama started running for president, he was the longest of long shots. You know, he was a guy, Barack Hussein Obama, running for president um, a few years out of the Illinois State Senate, running against Hillary Clinton, sort of probably the largest front runner and in non-incumbent front runner in Democratic primary history. John Edwards, um, who was also a thing back then, but he was this, the most recent vice presidential uh, nominee, and we looked, you know, and if you, did, and so just on paper we were, we were a long shot, but also we got deep into the data, and we looked at um, who voted in the 2004, the most recent 2004 presidential primaries, and we realized by looking at it that if the exact same people showed up in 2008 who showed up in 2004 in the early primary states like Iowa and New Hampshire, Barack Obama would lose. We could not win in that environment, so the only way to win was to alter the shape of the electorate, which means get new people in the process, right? And who were the people available to Barack Obama? Young people who were motivated by his, his opposition to the Iraq war, to his, he had a message of generational change that spoke to young people, and he seemed like kind of a cooler presidential candidate that we'd had in a long time, and so this was our group. But here's the problem with that. All the tools of campaigns back then are built around communicating through traditional legacy media outlets. You give speeches, you give press conferences, they're covered by television, you do interviews with newspapers, or you buy ads on all those things. But the people we needed to reach were the people least likely to get their information from those outlets. So the only tool left to us was the internet. And so we decided to make a big bet. And it's easy to make a big bet when, you, when you, we don't have a lot to lose. Um, and we made a big bet on the internet and decided to make it a central piece of our campaign. And President Obama sort of got this intuitively because he's a, um, uh, as a community organizer, he, this is his background, and so he understood the organizing power of the internet. And we had a couple of people, including David Fluff, our campaign manager, and Joe Rosbars, who 
was our digital director who had worked for Howard Dean, who are, are geniuses basically, and they sort of saw the power here. And they put in place a, uh, a three, what I, what I view as a three-part strategy for how to build a successful digital operation, um, and which I think applies not just to campaigns, but across the board. And it's, they referred to it as invest, integrate, and innovate. And so invest meant putting real resources, both capital and people, in your digital operation. You know, by the end of the campaign, we had 200 people working our digital operation. Now, that's larger than most, I suspect, but it was a lot. And we had people doing everything, whether it was coding, handling the website, writing emails, creating videos, uh, managing our, the social media world, which was primarily Facebook at that time. And um, we hired a chief technology officer. Uh, we put real money into it, um, which is not something that I think a lot of, even to this day, companies and political campaigns and governmental agencies fail to do. They like to talk about digital, but then their natural inclination, because the people at the very top have an older mindset, they put money in the same old stuff they put it in before. In campaigns, that's television advertising or field organizers. Um, but we invested deeply in, um, in, in the digital operation. And then integrate. The other mistake that, you know, certainly in my political and campaign ex and governmental experience happens, but I see this in people I talk to in the private sector all the time, is that people like to talk a big game about digital, but when it comes time to actually integrating them into the organization, they don't do that. And so traditionally in campaigns before the Obama campaign, the digital operation was an arm of the communications department. And so the person who was in charge of getting free media coverage and, the me and honing the message was also in charge of digital. So it was sort of like a stepchild of the organization. Barack Obama changed that. And our digital director reported directly to the campaign manager. It was on par with the person in charge of fundraising, the person in charge of politics, the person in charge of communications. Because digital is not just a communications tool. It's a way of thinking that can influence all elements of the campaign. So our digital director was in, in on all the decisions in on involved in all the senior staff meetings and in a part of the decision-making apparatus because, and how the benefit of that ended up being was there were originally, what it, we be, began able to use the, use the internet, use digital strategies to improve, not just our communications, but our fundraising and beyond just sending out the innumerable emails you all still get in your email, which I have to apologize for everywhere I go, but, um, but in finding ways to help people use the internet to raise money become you know, small grassroots fundraisers, raise money from their friends, helping them figure out how to organize voters um, and register people to vote, all because the digital operation was integrated. And the last part was innovate. And this came in part from the president's meeting with Steve Jobs, which is we knew that the campaign, the, end of the, the way the world looked at the end of the campaign was to be different than it looked when we started. And so we were, had a, took an element of our time and energy uh, and focus on innovating for the next thing. And so we recruited people from engineers from Google, uh, from Facebook. One of the, our early staffers uh, was a guy named Chris Hughes, who was one of the founders of Facebook, um, who came to work for us. So we had these people who were think, constantly tasked with thinking about the future. And so when the iPhone came out, we were ready with, uh, we had a bit of a head start, obviously, but we came out with, we were ready with, um, an app that allowed people to access information on the campaign right off the bat. We were, um, Facebook was not the behemoth it is now, so it wasn't the best way to reach all of our supporters. And so we created our own social network, something called My Barack Obama, which Obama supporters could register, join, and interact with each other on and raise money from each other and organize each other on. And we did these things and it gave us, uh, we were constantly one or two steps ahead not just the other campaigns, but sort of the, the learning curve on the digital world. And so with those strategies, we obviously won. And you know, I think, um, and I think hopefully others would agree, we changed politics, and not just in the country, but in the world. Um, I had the opportunity to visit you know, upwards of 50 countries with the president um, during my six years in the White House. And more often than not, you would, we'd be in meetings, and, the, and these other world leaders would tell the president that they had, they had emulated his strategies to try to, you know, everyone wanted to have the Obama 08 campaign in X country. And, um, and if they were up for re-election, you know, their political aides would sometimes pull some of us aside and try to like pick our brains for things. And so go after the election, we felt pretty good about ourselves. We, you know, we 
We, you know, we had some wind in our backs. We felt, you know, we changed politics and you feel you can get a bit of a head, a big head after winning an election. And so we, we're going in the White House with all these big dreams that we're going to um, do for government what we did for politics. Use the internet to change government. And then we got to government and not so much. Uh, the first day we walked in, um, these like old clunky computers um, that we had, you know, we were all, everyone was using like sleek laptops and people were on, on Macs in the campaign. We get on these like old gateway computers, which were still a thing back then. And um, the no laptops, like you had, to, there was, you had to check a laptop out um, from some office somewhere and it weighed like 10 pounds. So it like really wasn't even worth doing. And the federal government for reasons I still to this day don't understand had blocked Twitter, Facebook, Gmail, Gchat on everyone's computer. And the logic was putatively to prevent people from getting hacked, but I think it was also to keep people from like, the idea back then was like, if you were on Facebook, you certainly weren't doing anything work related. You must be like wasting you know, valuable taxpayer dollars, so we're not gonna give you any access to that. And so, we were in, but it was more than just the technology. The entire communications apparatus of the government had not changed in 30 years. I, w I worked on the transition, which is part of your job is to prepare for the president to take over. And so we get, you get all these staffing charts for how the White House is set up. And so I was in charge of communications, and you get it. And it is literally, and they give you a book with all the staffing structures of the various communications operations going back. And I realized that the communications office in the White House had not fundamentally changed in any real way since Jimmy Carter. I mean, cable news did not exist then for any purpose, yet we still had this operation that was set up entirely around the reporters who would come to the White House every day and question the press secretary, the White House press corps. And no, so nothing had changed. And when I asked for the staffing structure or the budget for the digital operation for the previous uh, administration, there was none to be had because they essentially had, I think it was about one person who updated content on the website and everything else was done with like all the back end and technology was done by um, government contractors who are not in danger of inventing the next iPhone. And um, <laughs> so we began with this great task. And after a few weeks, you know, the president had high expectations for us. And, you know, we came in the middle of a sort of a governing and economic crisis. And the president was right off the bat wondering why we weren't doing all the cool things we were doing in the campaign. So we went in and tried to explain to him that our tools kind of sucked. And <laughs> he, and he was trying to get to like, to give him, have him give us a break. And he, you know, as you know, he kind of did into that whole yes we can thing, and so he didn't really take no for an answer. And, but he understood that this was gonna take some effort, and so he said part of our task was do all the policy things we'd run for, but was also to bring the gov try to bring the government to the 21st century, um, technologically. My piece of that was the communications operation, and it took a lot of work, a lot of successes, some failures, uh, I can admit that now, I guess, and, um, but over the course of time, we tried a lot of different things. We, we put the president um, in environments presidents had never been before. We had the first Facebook chat, the first Twitter Q&A. The president has his own Twitter handle now. We did the first ever online digital, digital only interview, which was like groundbreaking at the time, back in 2009. And if you had seen the reaction of the old media TV types when we did that, you would have thought we had um, fomented revolution or something. And we did all that, and by the time I left, um, the, the digital communications mentality and strategy of the White House were ones that were being looked at and emulated by people around the world and in private sector and the nonprofit world, and certainly from all the folks who are running for president now. And they've done even much greater things in the six months since I left. Um, they're getting better and better. But we made a ton of progress. But in the course of that, we learned a lot of lessons. And I wanted to share with you five lessons that we learned um, uh, that I think apply, the White House is a unique place, but apply, I think can apply to any business, big or small, nonprofit, political campaign, um, state and local government, as you think about how to communicate in this new chaotic digital media environment. The first one is invest in the right people, hire the right people. And that sounds simple. Um, but most people don't do it. And usually, you have to hire the right people and you have to hire enough of them. And you can have all the, the best technology in the world. You can hire the most high-priced consultants um, to come in and, 
uh, give you a PowerPoint about what a good digital strategy would be. I'm happy to do that for anyone who wants it, but I don't recommend it. And, but without the right people, you're not gonna succeed. And that doesn't just mean having the um, people who can code or have real technological know-how. It means hiring people who have vision. And so you want people who are thinking not just about the world, how people are communicating today, but how they're, communicate, how they're gonna be communicating six months from now. Because in, the world is changing so fast that you can have the absolute most perfect strategy for today and feel really good about yourself, and six months from now, you're gonna be missing a big piece of it. You know, um, to give you an example, in 2008, we almost never, on you know, the 2008 campaign that we were, you know, as I mentioned, thought about is like on the cutting edge of using the internet, never really thought about or used Twitter. We had a Twitter account, some guys in the digital staff used it periodically, but it was never a part of our strategy. By the time we got to 2012, Twitter was an absolute core part of the campaign's communication strategy. We, in 2012, we never thought about Snapchat. Never even, the word Snapchat were never mentioned in any meeting I was in. And by 2016, in next year's presidential election, Snapchat is gonna be, a, I promise you all the campaigns right now are dramatic, are spending a ton of time figuring out how they're gonna use Snapchat to reach younger voters. And so, and by 2020, there'll be something else. And so, you need people to have vision uh, about how it's gonna work, and those people, um, are not the people government usually hires. Um, they are younger than um, certainly I am, because uh, you want people who are uh, the most creative thinking about how the internet is used is or will always be young people because they're all, they're just on the cutting edge of the new platforms. And they, here's one thing I learned: they really don't like to wear suits and ties to work. And so <laughs> we discovered that a major recruiting impediment for the people we were trying to get from, but mostly from Silicon Valley, but from digital communities all around the country, was the suit and tie thing. And so the president actually gave dispensation to the digital staff uh, that they don't have to wear suits and ties. So if you ever are on a White House tour and you see like some very young man or woman walking around in like jeans and a ratty hoodie, they are not homeless people who stuck in. <laughs> they actually work for us and are very smart. Um, so hire the right people. Uh, second thing is, and this is probably the hardest lesson for us to learn in the White House and to like wrap our minds around, which is the internet values authenticity above everything else. And authenticity means taking risks. And that is very hard for people in politics to do. But it's not just politics, you see it in large, any large organization as well. Because the people who have my job, um, either in private sector or public sector, our tendency is to protect our bosses or our companies or organizations from mistakes. We are naturally risk adverse people. Someone comes with an idea and we say, here are the five things, ways it could blow up in your face. And that is partially what you want and it's also partially psychological because um, it's, it's easier to, um, you can have a great career if you just hit singles and doubles the whole time. Uh, but if, you hit, if you're gonna swing for, swing for the fences, you're gonna strike out as well. And, but I think in this day and age, in the internet age, if you put out content that is neither authentic nor interesting, it's not only that just it's not gonna have impact, we won't get the, the shares or the views that you like, it actually could get ridiculed. This is particularly true um, when you're in a high profile position like the White House. And so what I came to learn over many years is, is the bigger risk in the digital age is not taking risks. You will, you will, you're doomed to fail if you don't try to do things. And it's very hard for politicians to um, put themselves out there in a way, because they're constantly criticized. Um, too, but you have to do it or you won't succeed. And, and politicians who do not have the skill to do that in a way that President Obama does, for, of either party, will struggle in the, in the digital media world. But, and there's a, there's a tension here, is even if you agree you're gonna take risks, everyone comes to you all the time, and I'm sure you guys hear this from any of your clients or your companies and say, what can we do to go viral? And you're like, well, it's not that simple, frankly. Um, trip over a laptop is, it would be a good start. Um, and uh, the, but going viral for viral's sake is a waste of time. You don't, clicks for clicks sake don't work. I see all the time both politicians and corporations who have um, these very clever, funny Twitter campaigns or Facebook campaigns that 
get all, they, get, they do well in, this, in the sort of one-dimensional thinking of how many retweets did we get, but do nothing to make me like the politician more, want to engage with the brand more, buy, the, buy products from the brand or learn more about them. And so, and this is particularly true in the White House, like you're the President of the United States, it comes a lot of formalities and traffic to the office. So if you're just like, you know, doing cat videos all day long, it's probably gonna hurt you. Um, but what we learned over time was to um, bury the, our message or our strategic objective in content that had potential to go viral. Now the two most, I think, resonant examples of the things we've done are um, when the president sat down with Zach Galifianakis to tape between two ferns. Um, uh, it even sounds ridiculous now, I recognize. Um, and last year, I guess it was earlier this year, the president taped a video for BuzzFeed where he did a bunch of um, funny, some would say ridiculous, embarrassing things, including using a selfie stick, um, which I think is the lowest order uh, possible. Um, and hopefully you guys have seen these videos. Uh, if you haven't, I, I recommend them. Um, they're funny. The president's pretty good at making fun of himself. Um, and if you have seen them, you probably have two questions. The first is, how did you convince the president to do these things? And the second is, why? Well, the first one, the first one is, this was kind of my job, which was, because I'd worked there the longest, and so I'd, been, I'd known the, probably, I had the longest relationship with the president, and so, my job was often to go in and the president would be sitting in the Oval Office, which you know, even if you go work there every day is a pretty intimidating place. And he'd be sitting at his desk, which is the desk that you know, every president for a century has used. And like reading, writing, thinking, whatever it is presidents do, and I'd have to like sort of knock on the door and be like, um, sir, do you have a second? And he'd be like, he'd kind of look up, and you know, he doesn't get a lot of spare time, so it's not always, not always super happy to see me. And, go in and, you know, and people do go in there and they're like, hey, there's a hurricane coming or there's a, you know, an international incident and I go in and to, be, to ask him to do um, ridiculous things like um, these videos or the time I had to go in there with a couple other people and try to convince him to do something that he had never heard of called slow jamming the news with Jimmy Fallon. And, <laughs> but the truth of it is, uh, as ridiculous as it is and as he would sometimes grimace at me for like, really, you're wasting my time with this, um, is it was easier to convince him you would think, because he, you know, he was our first president who had sort of spent their adult life using the internet. So he kind of understood how it worked. Um, you know, and he had an iPad, and he used, that was, it became his primary source of reading the news and um, seeing what's on the internet and following sports. Um, so he kind of got it, and if you could go in there with some data as to why um, it, Matt, why it made sense, why this outlet made sense. You could get him to do it, he was pretty game. Like, if it worked out poorly, like that was on me and I would suffer for that later, but you could get him to do it. Um, so then the question is why? In both these, we did both of these things for the same reason, but this could apply to any task that we would have. For these, we did one of these in 2014 and one in 2015, and both times it was designed around signing people up for the Affordable Care Act, and there's a deadline for the open enrollment period, and if you don't sign up by that deadline, then you can't have health insurance. And our primary target audience in both cases was young people, and primarily young males. And because these are the people you want to get, one, young males, having been one once myself, are less responsible than young females, and so we're less likely to sign up for um, health care. But also, you need to, they are important to the, the health care risk pool. You need more healthy people in there, otherwise the premiums go up for everyone. And we were, you know, struggling. These are the, they're the hardest people to get. And, but the problem is, like we face on the campaign, which is all the normal ways in which we would communicate about the deadline to the world. You know, we could, we, President could give a speech. There's this deadline. We could have a press conference. We could write an op-ed. We could have done all those things, and they would have been seen by a tiny fraction of our target audience, because that's not where they're getting their news. But they do get their news on the internet, and they do get information on the internet. And so in both these cases, we agreed to do these insane things um, if they gave the president an opportunity to say what the deadline was and include the link to healthcare.gov. And they both worked phenomenally. On Between Two Ferns, you actually could click directly from the Between Two Ferns link to go to healthcare.gov. And we saw this huge surge in young people going to the website and actually filling out applications for healthcare. And the BuzzFeed video, um, which was posted on Facebook and had 50 million views. To give you some perspective, the last day of the union was seen by 30 million people. Um, 
uh, we saw a huge jump in referrals from Facebook to um, between two firms. And so this to me is the successful strategy, which is you have to take risks, but do it in a way that is cons in, take risks, be authentic, and do it in a way that's consistent with your strategy. Um, like I said, clicks for clicks sake um, is a great thing to go back to your boss and say, look at all these retweets we got, but you haven't actually advanced your goal. The third lesson is that every social platform is not a tool, it's a community. And you have to speak to that community, you have to respect that community, you have to speak the language of that community. And so when we first started out in the White House and all these tools were new, we sort of just used them as extensions of our traditional earned media strategy. We would just post a video of the president's speech, you know, 45 minutes long on Facebook. We would just tweet out links to press releases and statements. Um, like not, just the link, not an actual tweet with the statement, just see the president's statement here, click this link and try to drive people to our website. And they did fine because he's president of the United States and people are you know, interested in things he does. Uh, but not, they didn't have any real success. They didn't, we felt no, pedi there was mild added value of doing it, but nothing, we weren't breaking through in any real way. And what we came to understand was that you have to, is that you can, it is not enough to have a quote unquote social media strategy. You have to have a Facebook strategy, a Twitter strategy, an Instagram strategy, a strategy, a Snapchat strategy, a strategy of the next thing that'll be here in six months. And you know, you have to, and so now we, we decided over time, that we, then once we switched and we're like, we're gonna start doing this in the parlance of these communities, we'll have shorter videos people actually watch on their Facebook feed. We'll you know, summarize the president's statement in a tweet in 140 characters. Uh, but then you, all, but you also, had, we decided the president had to visit these platforms himself uh, to actually interact with the community. And so he went to Facebook and he did, he did a live Facebook chat with Mark Zuckerberg, um, who actually put on a coat for the whole thing, which was impressive. Um, and we did a, the first ever Twitter Q&A, which was a fascinating experience because um, the president knew Facebook because he had kids. Um, Twitter was a little bit new to him when we first started this because it was something he was, had, even though it existed before we got in office, it really didn't sort of take off until after he'd been there. And so he kind of had to explain the whole thing to him and I probably thought it was best for his sanity that he not be on the actual platform and read what people were saying every day about him. Um, so we, we all gather in the Roosevelt Room, which is this very fancy, famous conference room in the White House um, that has um, FDR's Nobel Prize and Teddy Roosevelt's Congressional Medal of Honor on the wall. So it's like a pretty serious thing. But we set up this station where there's computers and the president's in there. And my original idea was that, the pre that someone would read the, tweet, the question to the president off the screen. The president would answer verbally. And then our, I had a, we'd asked a 22 year old, um, fresh out of college staffer to type it in. Because um, if, if you've ever seen the president answer questions at a press conference or debate, like brevity is not exactly his thing. Um, so getting to 140 characters seemed challenging. But after a few uh, questions, the president realized this was kind of fake. And so he basically wrestled the computer from the 22 year old, who there, there's a photo of this that exists in the White House. The look on the, on the poor kid's face as he's debating in his head whether he has to say yes to the commander in chief or, but if he does, I will literally murder him when he comes back to the office. Um, but he wisely picked the commander in chief over me. Um, and so but now the president's just up there just tweeting away. And we have no idea what he's gonna say. And <laughs> until it shows up in our feed like the rest of America, which is a fairly alarming thing um, since a president could like start a war or cause the market to drop with like one wrong sentence. Like a typo could be like the undoing of us. Um, <laughs> we survived uh, I mean, he did a bunch more and he always uh, did his own typing and he became very proud. I don't think he, I even do this phrase, but when he would get a touche where you would just audit, like type your thing in, it would just be 140 characters exactly. And so this became a very competitive thing as whether he could do this, get to 140 characters on every try. And so later, earlier this year, the president got his own Twitter account. Because we'd, we'd sort of realized that the, the community had changed over time. And now it just wasn't enough just to have, like we had a White House Gov account. There was an App Barack Obama campaign account that was run by the campaign and now um, a nonprofit organization that supports the president. But it wasn't, that wasn't enough because that was not a level of, authentic, we were no longer reaching the level of, of authenticity that the community expected. So after a lot of debate, President got his own Twitter account, and he's gotten pretty into it. And I'm told from my friends who still work in the White House, he'll often 
we, we don't let him actually tweet from his phone directly, um, but he uh, but he he will draft them, and he'll sometimes he'll just send tweets to the communication staff and be like, send this out, and it's not one of the situations where you can argue, so you just do it. Um, but it's given it's given him a voice to get involved in. Twitter is where the political conversation is happening in this country, and he gets to be directly involved in a way that gives him a comparative advantage to other politicians. And so, as you think about the, the social media platforms, don't think of them as tools, think of them as people. The, the next lesson is that, you know, as I said, we've moved from this broadcast world to this network world, and, but, and that has changed the expectations for how, for the public's expectations for what comes from not just politicians, but any institution that they're interacting with. The internet has brought down the barriers between government, brands, celebrities, athletes, and the public. And so now the public expects a greater level of engagement. So your strategy has, should not be to speak to people just using your <coughs> new tools. It's to speak with them, to converse with them. And too often, people in my line of work think, digital is just doing the same thing, just doing it on Facebook or Twitter. And that's not what it is. It's a different mindset where you're actually trying to converse. And you're trying to have, you, you want to run an engagement campaign, not a communications campaign. And um, the, um, and so over the course of time, we, we tried this with a lot of failures in the White House, because it took us a long time to figure out what made a successful engagement campaign. We would ask people for their stories about how the minimum wage would affect them. No one would tell us. We would ask people to tweet at the members of Congress. Not that many people would do it. And so over the course of that, we kind of had it came up with a three-part test for a successful um, engagement campaign. The first is think of it as a conversation, right? It's not, don't just ask people to do something, interact with them. Answer their questions, respond to them, you know, do things now like comment on their posts if the White House does that. President Obama did this on a, uh, Humans of New York post recently um, on Instagram. Um, have, make, have it be a, a two-way conversation. Second, um, know who you are, um, know who, who your audience is and talk to them in the way in which they want to be speak. And the third, I think most important and hardest is develop an emotional connection with the audience. And, you know, they have to, no one is going, you're asking people, you're not just telling people things, you're asking them to do things. You're asking them to respond to you, you're asking them to, you're asking to enlist them in your communications effort because you want them to share your information with their friends. And so you're, that's a high bar. And if they don't care, they're not gonna do it. And so you have to, you know, we discovered there are certain issues that had greater success to that for the White House. Climate change, civil rights, those sorts of issues people get very engaged in. Tax policy engagement campaigns, not so much. Um, but then also, but it's not just to have an issue, you gotta communicate it in an emotionally compelling way. That's why you often see the president using, you know, talking about real people, um, about how it affects them, and that you know, does it or do it in a very compelling photo, like um, our Pete Souza, White House photographer, puts on Instagram all the time. Um, so you have to have that emotional connection. So those are the steps. The last lesson I would give you is a lesson we got also from the campaign, which is plan for the future. As I said, the world is changing incredibly fast, and you can have the perfect strategy for today, and six months from now, you're gonna be behind the times. And so you have to take some element of your thinking, your staff, your resources, and focus it on an effort to think about the future. And the way to do that is to, is to reach outward. Last year, in 2014, we'd had a pretty tough election cycle, and a pretty tough year, frankly, and the president brought a bunch of us in, and he, and we did a sort of an analysis of our communications efforts. And we realized that while we've been way ahead of the curve in 2008, we kind of caught up to the curve up through 2012, that between 2012 and 2014, the world had changed and we had not kept up with it. And we had fallen behind and we were struggling to get our message out. We were being buffeted by viral information from other people. And so the president gave me this task, which is go out in the country, find the smartest people you can find um, in the digital world, <laughs> and pick their brains about the new things. And what came from, I learned so much from doing that. It's one of my great regrets I didn't do that every six months for six years. Um, and, but what came of it is a whole process we put in place with a sort of an ad hoc group of people who the White House meets with on a regular basis from Silicon Valley, from New York, we should, we should probably put some people in this room on that list, um, who 
can help us think about the next thing because they're not in the bubble every day. And so talk to the people on the cutting edge, not just the people who work at the new companies, but also the people who are thinking about investing and starting the new companies. But what's the next thing? And if you do that, you're going to have an ability to constantly, even if you can't stay ahead of the curve, you can stay at the curve. And that's a huge challenge. So these lessons, hire the right people, be, be authentic above all else, think of social media platforms as a community, engage, don't broadcast, and plan for the future are lessons that we learned in the White House. I wish someone had given me a cheat sheet with that when we got there because it would have made my life a lot easier. Um, but I think there are lessons that even though the White House is a unique place, they can um, apply to everyone, uh, to all sorts of organizations. And um, I hope they're useful to you. And I would say, in conclusion, that we are in, for all the change that has come to now in my eight years sort of working in this space, I think this is a fraction of the change to come in the next eight years. And that's because phones are getting more powerful, the internet's getting faster, the economics of the digital media space are changing dramatically. We have these new platforms that didn't exist a few years ago, like BuzzFeed and Vox and Vice, that are sort of blowing up and changing the way media is done. And then I think most importantly, just as the, inter the sort of the invention of the internet and blogs disrupted the newspaper and print model, the, we are now in a place where streaming services and live video services like Periscope and Meerkat are disrupting the TV, the broadcast TV model. And so. That's the last vestige of the old world. At the end of the day, the best way to reach people is still be on 60 Minutes. That's going to change very quickly as the media becomes more democratized. And that just means this huge space of change where ideas will come, new strategies will be implemented. And to me, it's a super exciting time. This, is, this question of how we communicate now and in the future has been a personal fascination of mine. And it's, and it's what I've continued to work on in my um, post-White House semi-retirement. Um, and so I'm very excited for all of you who I know are very interested in this and very excited about it. And uh, I want to thank you for listening to me drone on here. And I'm happy to take as many questions as Jason will let me take. No. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I'll give you sort of a weird example. Well, um, I mean, there are times whenever, like whenever you're on the public stage, if you say, whether it's you're at a press conference or on Twitter, you say one wrong word. The internet actually um, gave, well, here would be, for example, our first online interview we did with YouTube, right? And it was after the first day of the union, and we wanted to be grassroots about it, so. People got to ask questions. They got to vote their questions up. And unsurprisingly, the thing that got to the top of the list was legalization of marijuana, which this is a very active group of people, um, belying all the stereotypes, I guess. And, um, uh, and so, the, so we, we had all these. We want to talk about the Recovery Act, the economy. But because you, you're, what you're doing here in this case is seeding control. And so, but because that was number one question, we had to take that question. And so all the news coverage out of it was, the president didn't say anything super controversial, but if you're talking about legalizing marijuana the day after the State of the Union, then you probably have stumbled in some way, shape, or form. And so that was an example. You do have a, you know, you're seating control, so they're always sort of, um, you lose, it's not so much you say missteps, if you lose control of your own story, but that's sort of the nature of the beast, because if you're overly controlled, you're not going to get your message out. All of it. You know, that's part of the task is to, you know, at POTUS, we'll go to the next POTUS. Um, all the, the at whitehouse.gov, the White House email list will all transfer. It's all non governmental. They'll have to decide whether they want to do the same things, but they'll have the tools in the, in the technological infrastructure we put in place. And I think I'm obviously a fairly partisan uh, Democrat, but I think that there is a gov like, the world is better, whoever is president, if the Government has a capacity to communicate with people in a, in a way in which it, the people can interact with it and see it. You know, it's not just like, can a president sell their policies? That's obviously important to someone like me. But there's also just like, how do you tell people there's a hurricane coming and where to evacuate? How do you tell people how to access 
benefits they may have or tax cuts they may have. And we, the government was far behind when I started. There's, it's caught up, but a lot of work to do. But I think whoever the next president is, you know, I will actually take, I think this president will take some measure of pride, you, you know, even if it's a, you know, someone from a different party, that they'll have all these tools um, to go, and they'll have a huge Twitter following thanks to us. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think first it's important to think that the press gets very upset when we do things like the YouTube interviews, and I think and there is some look. This it's an existential crisis for them. I understand why they would feel that way. Uh, but our strategy, they always say, you're going around us. And I always say to them, we are not, our strategy is not either or, old or new. It's and both. Because you have to. There's still a huge group of the world who will get their news from traditional news sources. You're going to, most of you probably picked up, read the newspaper either online or delivered to your door today. You'll watch the news tonight. And that's still an important way to reach people. So you have to do, like, the, the interview with Glozell and the other YouTube folks was not in substitution for an interview with Chuck Todd to meet the press. It was in addition to. And if a politician is just doing interviews with non-trained journalists, I think that's bad for democracy. And this president uh, won't do that, even if it would seem appealing at times. And I think in the I think the value of trained journalists is going to go up in the internet sphere as people become as, as more and more information gets out there. They're going to they. People are looking for news curators to help them understand what's happening, but also say this is real and this isn't. And so I think for real, for trained journal, the value of a trained journalist goes way up when they're compete in this competitive environment. The economics of it are lacking behind the, the intrinsic social value of it, but it'll get there. It's what the stealth startup is really a fact that we were way too late to this. It takes your signature, the website of your signature domestic policy accomplishment breaking in a horribly embarrassing way to realize. What we sort of took from that is we were in a huge trouble. We called every smart person in Silicon Valley we could find to come fix it, and they all came. And the takeaway from that was we can at like, oh, yeah, you're the White House. If you ask people to come work for you, they'll probably do it. And one of the guys, a guy named Mikey Dickerson, who was a uh, top guy at Google who came to help us, he was going to go back to Google. And he thought to, he thought to himself, what, I've already been quite successful in my private sector life. What could I do? I have two choices. I could stay here and help more people get health care, or I could go back to Google and make the search engine better. Like, what is a more appealing thing? And we realized that message applied to a lot of people. And so we brought a lot of people into government, people who have been very successful financially and otherwise, to come in and help. And our hope is the next person will continue that effort. You know, you also, it's important, you know, we have an advantage that ideologically and sort of culturally, uh, there's a lot of connectivity between sort of the tech folks in Silicon Valley, at least, and the president um, in this administration. Uh, but our hope is that, that that will continue on because they're just fundamentally basic technological infrastructure things that people in Silicon Valley, and I say Silicon Valley to mean digital folks generally, not just located in that small part of California, but that people in the tech sector can fix that the, the, just the, the ability and know-how of the government is not up to. So I hope, they'll, I hope they'll continue that. Oh, thank you. Sure. Um, I would say I had high expectations going into this cycle because one of the sort of the, you know, every campaign is about trying to fix the, is trying to refight the last war. And one of the thought, one of the thoughts in like Republican political consultant circles was there were a couple of reasons they lost. One of them was Obama beat them in tech. It was sort of demographic advantage, data advantage, and tech. And he, we were just way more savvy in how to use the internet. And so I thought the Republicans would invest deeply in this. And they have done so much less than I had expected. Um, the, and are being more risk adverse than I thought. 
Now, I will say in their defense, they have a different challenge than a Democrat does because if you're just, like, you only have X amount of time and energy and resources and you gotta target it on who your base is and the, the folks demographically who vote in a Republican primary are skew older than a Democratic primary. So you would, you, you would allocate more of your resources to traditional media that's more likely to reach um, older folks than digital folks, but still, they're doing less. Um, I think the, on the Democratic side, I think, which I probably paid more closely attention, more close attention to, the, um, I would say that on the Republican side, I think Rand Paul, for all of his other campaign struggles, has done, has had a creative um, approach to digital. He's taken some risk. He did some pretty innovative Snapchat ads, um, one where he cut the tax code with a chainsaw, um, uh, which is, I mean, it, it's one of those things that's viral and quasi on message, so, Kudos. Um, on the Democratic side, I think um, one of the challenges, I think Bernie Sanders has done some very smart stuff. He's clearly using the internet as an organizing tool similar to the way Barack Obama did in 2008. Like, you don't get those crowds by word of, word of mouth in 2015. Um, uh, I think Hillary Clinton is doing some good stuff. I'm a little bit biased. Her digital folks are our old digital folks. Um, but it's also, whatever else you think about the president politically, He's good at this stuff in a way most politicians aren't. Now, he's pretty good at being funny. He's, um, like, he's willing to make fun of himself. He's willing to, you know, he's also in his second term, so he's probably even, he's less risk adverse than ever before. So it's harder, like, it's hard, sometimes I agree what the Clinton folks are doing. I'm like, I would have done X, Y, and Z. But Barack Obama's not Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton's not Barack Obama. They each come with their own strengths and weaknesses, and there are things that um, Barack Obama can do that she can't do, things are gonna work better for her. And so I think it's been a, my guess it's been basically a work in progress thus far. Um, I'd say the Democrats are probably getting a B, and the, and the Republicans probably a C, would be my guess. It's early though. This goes to, A, he likes to give speeches. Um, it's always been a thing. Uh, that's kind of how he got here. But um, it's, this is part of the and both, not either or. You know, and you have to do a pretty rigorous evaluation of use of time. There are times when, um, you know, local media is still incredibly powerful. And so the advantage of, there's, there is, is great advantage if the president were to come to Louisville and give a speech here then that would be, you know, that would be wall-to-wall -wall coverage for like four days, because it's cool when the president comes to your town, but, you know, and so that's worth it, but we sort of discovered giving speeches in Washington is not always the best use, because you don't get that local media coverage, and so you try to do both, and, you know, the State of the Union was one where we tried to mix, as we were rolling out the policies in it this past year, to mix purely digital rollouts, you know, like we found it can be if your choice is give a speech, you go to the East Room in the White House and speak to the White House Press Corps, or tape a video, which will take, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. Um, it's not that far, it just walks downstairs, but. Um, or to give a, or to tape a Facebook video and post it rolling out your new policy, it's probably more efficient to do the Facebook video. Uh, we rolled out our Universal Community College policy uh, that way. And so you, you have to mix both. But there's still a, you know, even, and I'm as guilty, guilty, of this, guilty of this as anyone when I worked in the White House, is there's still, you're sometimes still pulled into the old way of doing things. Like, we're not in this world where now all you have to do is just like tweet something, even though Donald Trump may be proving me wrong there. I would say that Donald Trump is actually using the internet quite well um, to great success, to the previous question. Um, but, so you need a mix, but you should always sort of look at the, there's nothing more valuable than, a, than time, is the one thing you can't get back, and so, there are gonna be times when a speech is worth it, and there are gonna be times when it's not worth it, and then when it's not worth it, you don't have other tools to get it out. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. I'm gonna walk around the other way. <laughs> <laughs>